Hello friends, our beautiful community. I'm so happy to start our IG Live today. We are going to be joined with Matt Kahn. This is so exciting. For those of you that do not know Matt Kahn, Matt is somebody that I've been following for so many years and learning from. We just recorded a podcast on Let's Talk Love. I can't wait for you to listen. I'm going to ask Matt to join, and I hope that those of you that are with us are going to be asking Matt your questions. We have 30 minutes with this incredible spiritual teacher and just um, a beautiful human being. Oh, I'm going to add you right now, Matt. My heart's racing. I'm so excited about this conversation. <laughs> I've been looking forward to it all week. Hi, Matt. Hey. Thank you for joining us on our IG Live. It's an honor to be here. I feel like we just, I feel like just a minute ago. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you and read yeah. your bio, and then we're going to dive into these these questions that were submitted by our community. Those of you that are joining us live, this is your chance to ask Matt Kahn your questions, okay? I, I This is it, people. you got to take advantage of this. It's a beautiful opportunity. So, Matt, you are a renowned spiritual teacher, wow. um, highly acclaimed empath, best-selling author, known for your transformative insights into the journey of awakening. Isn't that the truth? Your teachings focus on love as the ultimate path to self-realization, emphasizing the importance of our emotional freedom and the power of self-awareness. So today we are going to dive into these questions for our community. And I'm watching the chat. Are you ready? It's Super Tuesday. Yes, let's get super. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah. First question is... Mm. I have a hard time envisioning my future. Yes. I also understand we need to live in the moment and be present. What are your thoughts on this? I love this. It'll be like, it'll be like a lightning round. Yeah, it is a li um, lightning round. I would say that the universe already knows where we're going and the best way to get us there. And so we don't need to envision the future in order to feel as if we're being magnetized in that direction. So I love that they said, you know, it's important to be in the present moment. The way I like to teach the law of attraction is that you are the law of attraction, which means everything is magnetized to you versus you having to run towards something else. So. I like the idea of if you know what you desire, put it out to the universe. I do it very casually. I speak out loud to the universe all the time. Hey, universe, kind of would like this right now. And I was jokingly say, please bring this to me or whatever else you got planned, you know? Yeah. And, and then you just go about your life. But I would say that there's a lot of people going through awakening that when their ego is going through a very massive integration, you're not identified with desire. You don't know what you desire. And then the fear is, if I don't know what I desire, then I might be attracting purgatory or I'm in limbo land. But the truth is the universe is always working through you. The universe always knows where it's guiding you. We don't have to know where things are headed to know that we're being divinely guided. And so I would say the less we try to control things and the more we just make empowered decisions one present moment at a time, the better off we're going to be, truly. I really like yeah. that. Yeah, thank you. How can I tell the difference between anxiety and intuition? Interesting. Well, sometimes anxiety is the response we have to our intuition because anxiety is oftentimes the response our ego has to if I go in that direction, I don't know that I'm going to be supported. I don't know that I'm safe. So I would say that anxiety is is letting us know how safe or unsafe we're feeling in a certain experience. But anxiety isn't like if I have anxiety, it doesn't mean it's not my intuition because my ego might be resp responding anxiously to my intuition. If my intuition says go in this direction and the universe is always wanting us to go in the direction that aligns us more with the maturity of our soul. 
And if your ego goes, that threatens me, you're going to feel anxious. And then you might think maybe that's not what the universe wants me to do. So I would say intuition are the wisest, most courageous choices that you can make that help you mature and grow on a soul level, whether you're anxious or not. And then the journey becomes, how can I address the anxiety without avoiding the thing that's good for me? Mm. Okay. So like if I, for example, had to do something that I knew was good for me, but it made me feel anxious. Maybe I had to go to a doctor and I'm afraid of doctors. And so I go, I'm anxious. It's not that my anxiousness means I shouldn't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. It means I should deal with my anxiety separately while scheduling with my doctor. So of course, as I always teach, whatever arises, love that. So I would schedule with the doctor and then any anxiousness I feel about procedures, testing or lab results or whatever would be the parts of myself that I can dialogue with and I can love while still moving towards my doctor's appointment. So just to give an example. Yep. Okay. How can we change our perspective and stop taking rejection so personally? Rejection, right? Is not rejection is protection. Yeah. Or is yeah, it well, redirection? You no, know, it's it's all in the eye of the eye of the beholder, I suppose. I think that one of the things that we realize is the first thing to not taking things personally is the acceptance that it's okay that I do that I do take things personally. By the way, the acceptance that you do take things personally. Yeah. By the way, someone asked me if I had a health issue. I don't. I was just using the example yeah, of going of to, the doctor, go to the doctor because my inner my inner child doesn't like going to the doctor. Uh, but I'm totally healthy. I'm actually really good. Um, but thank you for asking. So the first step of not taking something personally is the acceptance that I do take things personally because most people will think taking things personally is wrong. It's not wrong. It's just that you will outgrow taking things personally if you first accept that it's okay that I do take personally. Or if you say to yourself, I take things personally and I, and it's, and I accept that I think this is a wrong way to be. Whatever it is, can we accept how personally we take things? Now, what happens is over time, you will outgrow taking something personally because you will see someone else's decision is more about what's best for their journey or their need to avoid than about you. Mm -hmm. So I was in a journey where I had to accept that I took everything personally in my life. Part of the gift of taking things personally is I became really, really incredible in my line of work, meaning I took such pride in how I do things because I took it personally. So that's actually a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I would also have to accept that while I work very hard and take my work seriously, I also take everyone else's choices in my life very seriously and personally. And I would accept I take things personally. I take things personally. And as I accepted how personally I always take everything, and I, as I accepted that I would always make other people's decisions about me and something not good enough about me, I learned to outgrow that point of view through acceptance. And I just started seeing that 99% of the time, other people's choices are only about them. And so I did that not by trying not to take it personally, but by accepting I'm Matt Kahn, take everything a thousand percent personally and it's okay and once it was okay to take it personally was the moment my ego stopped doing it mm -hmm. really like that yeah different, different approach yep yep this, this question is coming in the chat how could i forgive someone who's blatantly ignoring my feelings and my desire for solitude well, I think the first thing we need to do is we need to create boundaries to 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 create an environment where they don't have an ability to do that. And again, we talked in the interview we just did that forgiveness is not about making something OK or saying it's OK. Mm -hmm. That forgiveness is saying that trauma on any level 
is how people hide their pain inside the bodies or energy fields of others. So when we say forgiveness, we're not saying it's okay. We're saying, I no longer allow this person to abuse me, abuse my boundaries, and to hide their pain in my energy field. And I call upon the universe to rush them through, rush them towards the next stage of their healing journey so that they don't have to disrespect my boundaries or anyone else's boundaries again. So it's kind of like when you think of when people are hurt, they either blame themselves or they seek retribution. And what's amazing is that from the perspective of someone's ego who harms another person, the most harmful thing you can do is pray for their healing. Because the one thing that person doesn't want to do is heal, surrender, be uncomfortable. So when you forgive someone, you're saying, you will not disrespect my boundaries. You will not hide your pain in my energy field. And I will not allow you to do that to another person. And I call on the universe to move you into your healing journey and take you through the journey of surrender. And I'm going to create boundaries and keep a distance from you so that I don't distract you from the healing you require. Mm -hmm. That's, that's good. Boom. Drop the mic. <laughs> How can I feel safe in my being and my mission? How can I feel safe? Mm -hmm. Being in your mission is not about safety. It's about service. So, oh. so if you are mm -hmm. working at a soup kitchen, and the soup kitchen is located in a rough part of town, you are either gonna trust that the universe will surround you with light and protect you and not prevent you from feeding the hungry, or you will decide that the value of not stepping into that experience is a higher value than serving people. So we can't find safety before we step into our mission Safety is something we find when we step into our mission first. Meaning, I could never guarantee that when I stepped on stage 18 years ago to teach all the things that even to this day, the things I teach are still think, thought of as new, different, cutting edge, which means things I say isn't what people are used to hearing. And I had to get used to in the beginning, that wasn't always a warm audience. Like when I first started on stage, it was the weirdest thing I discovered to where if I said something that was different, they would go, I don't know, I've never heard that before. But if I said something that they totally agreed with, they'd go, ah, I've already heard it before. So you're not, you can't really win. Mm -hmm. So I had to realize I'm here to serve a mission. I'm here to be in unsafe waters. And for me, unsafe waters was speaking in front of a room of people who I didn't know if they liked me or approved of me or not. And I'm just here to serve the will of divinity and speak the truth that wants to speak through me. And there are people that would sit there and listen to me and shake their head and I don't know about this and whatever it was, but I found safety by choosing my mission first. So if you choose your mission first, real safety will be found. If you need to find safety first, it won't be the deepest, highest mission. Because the mission of bringing light to where light needs to be is not always gonna feel safe. And this is about, can I focus more on trusting the divine? And even if I'm not willing to step into something, how can I serve a smaller mission? What can I do? Mission first. First, that's where real safety is. Mm, I really like that. Thank you. Do you have tools for how to live more from our soul and how to know when we are living from our ego? Absolutely. So the, I love you too. I like all these comments. Hello everyone. So the way you know you're living from your ego is that ego is always trying to make a choice to guarantee a certain outcome. So the ego chooses based on what I think is going to happen. The soul chooses something based on how it's going to help me grow into my highest potential. So for example, if you're in a relationship that's not working for you, an ego will not 
likely be ready to choose out of a relationship unless a new one is waiting for them or they can somehow be guaranteed they're going to have another partner right the ego doesn't want to say goodbye to what doesn't work because what if there's no one left and then i'm really screwed but the soul says whether there's another partner waiting for me and there always is i'm going to say no to a relationship as a way of building a relationship with my truth I'm not going to wait for the next partner. I'm not going to trade up. I'm not going to make this about transactional relationships. When something's not working, I'm using this as a moment to build integrity and to say, if it's not a yes, it's a no. And if it's an I don't know, here's the funny thing. I don't know is what the ego hears and says, if it's I don't know, I keep saying yes until I know it's a no. The soul says, if it's I don't know, what do we hear in that statement? I don't know. We don't hear I don't yes, we hear I don't know. So we hear the sound of no, which means it's a no until it's a full yes. So that so if it's I don't know, the soul says that's still a no. If it's yes, it's a yes. If it's no, it's a no. The ego says, if it's a yes, it's a yes. If it's an I don't know, it's a yes. And if it's no, it's a no, but I'm still going to move towards it like it's a yes until I find something better. So the soul is, is where we find discernment. Yes is yes, no is no, and I don't know means no until it becomes a yes. Wow. And so we keep ourselves open. It's so, so much easier. Oh, it is. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Somebody is saying, right, if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. I learned that on Shark Tank. That's a great quote. If it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. I don't know. It's not I don't yes. <clears throat> and again, a lot of people get into the fear of missing out. But what if there's not another opportunity? Well, we don't live in a we don't live in a small universe and why would that ever be the case right why, why, why would why would that infinite ever... possibilities always it, and you just have to get very clear on yes means yes no means no i don't know still a no <laughs> i really like that yeah. awesome. okay somebody's asking about the unity timeline yeah. Once I understand and accept being on the unity timeline, can I get booted off that trajectory? No. No one. <laughs> so to answer the question, that would be like if you were to give someone a dozen roses in a vase. And let's say that that person you gave them to act so, acted so spiritually out of alignment that the, the flowers in the vase just became a vase full of seeds. A rose can't go back to being a seed. A seed only becomes a rose. So once you're on a higher timeline, you can't fall out of it. You can only stay where you're at for the growth you need, take it as slowly as you need to, and then move up from there. So just in the same way, you can't get so out of practice. Like I can't get so out of practice with mathematics that like, like currently, like as I am, Matt Kahn, spiritual teacher, I couldn't tell you the first thing about algebra if you asked me, but that doesn't send me back to the sixth grade. Right. So we don't ever go backwards. We just move forwards. So if you're on the unity timeline, you're in the unity timeline. It's just you're exploring the nuances and stage of the unity timeline that helps you grow turn weaknesses into strengths, balance out imbalances, but you can't go backwards. And anyone that tells you you go backwards, honestly, either most likely doesn't really understand it beyond a third dimensional perspective. Yeah. And that's okay. But yeah. the truth is you can't go backwards. Yeah. A rose can't become seeds. You can't go back to sixth grade. Although if I could go back to sixth grade, I would rule six so, <laughs> so matt this that that, that relates to yeah. um <laughs> when we are like this is what you, we talked about earlier at the in the podcast yeah. was um living from a place 
of rather than this perpetual obsession with healing everything inside of us yeah living more from a place of we are healed yes and that doesn't mean that we're not going to be hurt again that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we want to you know like you said turning our weaknesses into strengths yes. um but it's living from this place of being the healer being yes. healed yes because you're not, it's not going to go backwards like right you're not going to go backwards the thing is is that all healing is an initiation to helping us remember that we have the power to heal ourselves because we're being initiated as healers now whether you're a healer that's going to work as a healer in a spa or whether you're going to open up your own business being a healer does not mean that's your profession you could be a school teacher you could be a mother you could be a foster parent you could be a government official you could be a corporate employee being a healer means you have been awakened so that your physical body is now a vessel through which the light of spirit transmits to all beings. And so when we're on a healing journey, the symptoms of healing is helping us remember how already healed we are. Now, we don't walk around pretending we're healed so we don't go to the doctor, we don't take supplements. Yeah. We're learning to support ourselves with all the therapies and all of the supplements and all of the sometimes pharmaceutical medications we need to remember the healing that has already occurred because present moment time is only the present moment of the past. Everything in the future future has already happened. So when we say we're in the present moment, we're only in the present mo moment of a movie that has already been filmed that we're living out. So even when you watch a movie for the first time, it's new to you, but you're watching a movie that was filmed about a year and a half ago. So we're always in the present moment of the past, remembering that what we think of as the future has already occurred. And as we allow what is already so to be accepted, we seem to move through time and space through a journey of transformation to become the very thing we acknowledge has already happened. So if I acknowledge I've already been healed, then I acknowledge that the journey of my healing is just remembering through time the healing that already occurred. So I can go to the doctor, I can take supplements, and I can say thank you for reminding me how healed I already am, and we will move forward as multi-dimensional co-creators and so my, uh, the mother of sentient beings said phenomenal thank you absolutely somebody's asking about the podcast it's called let's talk love and let's when it's talk. out we'll definitely share it absolutely yeah. it was a good one <laughs> okay how oh i think we i think we actually this is how can i find my passion yeah okay here's a good way to put it what would you love to spend your life doing even if you were the worst at it. So let's say your passion was baseball. I'm not a baseball fan, but let's say you're a baseball fan and you go, I would, my passion is baseball, even if I'm the worst at it. So maybe that means that you practice trying out for a team, even if you don't make it. Maybe you're meant to be a commentator for, for baseball, whatever it is. Maybe you're a blogger who talks about baseball. Whatever it is, maybe you have a radio show and you interview players. What would you like to spend your life doing even if you were the worst at it? Because a lot of times the ego will think about passion as what do I think I'm capable of doing well? And the truth is passion is what you love doing. So for example, I love cooking. I mean, I love teaching. So I teach. There are some people that think that I am a pioneering voice in the spiritual field and I've, I've, I've helped a lot of people. There are some people that look at me and go, I don't really get it. And there are some people who don't even know who I am, which is fine, who will look down on me. I can walk into a room and if you know who I am, there's that reaction and that happens a lot. If you don't know who I am, sometimes people will look at me and I don't know about this guy. You know what? I love what I do, and that's why I'm incredible at what I do. I'm also incredible at cooking, because I love cooking. So I don't mind spending time cooking a meal to make it what it needs to be. It's not about speed, it's about execution. And let's say I went to the Food Network, and I, and I went on one of their TV shows. And, I'm, and, I, and I go on a Food Network show with all these other amateur cooks. And let's say I was the worst out of all of them. 
I would still be memorable because of how good, how good of a time I had, how much I love it, how much I love learning. If I'm the worst at something, that just means I have a lot to learn and that means I get to enjoy growing and evolving. So passion is not what you think you could be good at. Passion is what do you want to spend your life doing, whether you're good at it or not. That's oh, what it's I really like that. Yeah. I've never, I haven't, I've never heard of, I mean, it makes perfect sense yeah. to me. And I just, I love that definition. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> do you have any advice for healing a relationship after adultery oh whoa all right taking these questions <laughs> up a management oh okay well here's the thing about adultery adultery is usually an action that occurs based on a lack of communication communication a breakdown in communication is always what creates some level of infidelity, adultery, or deception. So the question remains is, if, is, is the question is, and I've worked with people who have had this. I've worked with people that have healed the wound. And I've worked with people that, that couldn't heal the wound. Um, it's not necessarily as likely that it's healed, to be honest, usually adultery, um, because it's the, the real journey has to become are two people gonna are two people willing to learn how to communicate differently and can we look at the imbalances the lack of communication the misunderstandings that went into the adultery and are if two people are really um jack's asking what is adultery adultery is when you're in a committed relationship and one person cheats on the other person with another partner um, and when we're in a monogamous relationship, which doesn't mean you have to be with the one same person forever, it means just be with one person at a time, right? I could, I could go off on a whole separate talk of polyamory yeah. and how energetically it creates an energy called triangulation that no matter if people are consenting, it doesn't create healthy energy from an energetic standpoint. So if you're in a committed relationship, you're saying, I'm willing to be with one person at a time, giving this my full attention. And if it's not for me, I can walk away. And then there are people who get in relationships, they're not happy, they don't know how to communicate their needs, and they wind up acting out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. due to a lack of communication. Mm -hmm. So the, the answer is, if two people are willing to radically change their behavior and their ability to communicate, it is possible, it's not always probable, but it is possible. I've seen it happen, but I've seen it happen on a very small scale, usually people learn from either side of infidelity and learn to become better communicators for the next relationship. Yes. Yeah. How can I overcome self-doubt? This is our, I think this is our last question, Matt. We only have two minutes left, but I know you can do it. <laughs> I know, while FedEx is uh, at my door. Um, <laughs> Hey, I'm going to sign it for, for it. I'm multitasking here. Look at how present I'm being. Thank you, sir. Tom, thank you, thank you sir. Ah, FedEx. <laughs> and you know what it was, everyone? I'll tell you. My ring for my upcoming marriage got re -signed. Oh, yeah. We, because my finger apparently needs to fit the ring. So that was that. Oh, so, okay. Oh, that's so great, man. Woo! All right. So what was the last? I'm so sorry. What was the last question? How do we overcome self-doubt? Oh. How do we come, overcome self-doubt? In order to overcome self-doubt, <clears throat> we have to be connected to the universe to listen to a level of wisdom that is greater than the fears, inadequacies, gains and losses of our ego. So self-doubt is when we're listening to our ego more than we're listening to the voice of source. And even if you say, I don't hear source, I hear nothing. The silence you hear from source is always a silent message that all is well. So even if you don't hear anything, silence doesn't mean you're not hearing an answer. 
silence means all is well. And if silence means all is well, it means let's take the time to love our egos, but not indulge and believe its narrative. And can I spend more time trusting the silence than listening to my ego? And the less often I, I indulge my ego as if it's a guide and love my ego as the child in my heart, the more I start to open up to higher wisdom and the more likely I'm going to hear wisdom that I can't actually have the ability to doubt. So self-doubt is when we listen to the ego and indulge it too often. We want to honor the child. We want to listen to the child, but we don't have to take its advice and believe what it says. We're the parent. It's the child. The child can speak, but the child's not going to make adult decisions. Yes. Bam. <laughs> oh, thank you, Matt Khan. Thank you. This, this has been like, honestly, like my favorite hour and a half. Um, like in a very, very long time. I love you so much. And I'm just so grateful for your time today. And thank you everybody for joining us on the live. Thank you. We love you. I, yes, we sure do. And I hope you'll all come to our summit in April, 12, 13, 14. Go to the Real Love Ready website, please. And I hope you'll all join us in Vancouver or virtually. And Matt, you're going to be speaking one year. That's for one sure. One year I will be speaking. You got it. Okay. Love you. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.